friends, welcome back to another story in the life of the old time rock and roller. I hope you're having a great day. I know I am because you're here with me. If you recall in our last story, 2004 was a tremendous year for the band. Actually, the previous five years had been great and I had put out seven or eight albums in the last eight years. So it was time to chill back a little bit. It was a Friday night in February. Very cold night. I mean, below freezing. Unusual for Georgia. Kaylin and I went to our favorite Mexican restaurant, had margaritas, went home, we're getting ready for bed, and I took Abby and Tater outside to go potty before going to bed. I just went out in my underwear and a t-shirt because I was, you know, warm in the house. I wasn't going to be out there long standing in the front yard and I looked over at the garage and I saw what looked like a campfire and I looked closer and I noticed the inside of the garage was on fire. I ran in, I yelled to Kaylin, call the fire department, she called them and I noticed that all of the fire was close to the front of the door. So I thought, okay, I'm going to get a broom and I'm going to sweep whatever it is out into the driveway. Now both of our cars were parked into the driveway about 10 feet back from the garage door. So I went running for the fire and I yelled to Kaylin, open the door! So she pushed the door and as the garage door went up, it created a backdraft. And as soon as I had got up on the fire, it just multiplied by 10 times. It burnt all of the hair off my body immediately. And I had a little plastic broom that melted it. I tried to sweep some of the stuff out into the driveway. I had my Marshall stack in there. I had just received 2,000 copies of the Colorblind album. I had all my inventory, two PA systems, all Kaylin's stuff, all her records, photo albums. Everything of value about was in the garage. So the house was burning quickly and the dogs ran outside. They were very confused and Abby ran out around the house and then came in and sat on her bed. She didn't want to leave because she didn't know what was going on. Well, the fire department pulled up. In the meantime, just before they got there, I noticed the front of my car was burning. So I backed it out into the middle of the cul-de-sac and I told Kaylin to move her truck and she did. She got that out of there. The fire department pulled up. They didn't bother with my car, which was on fire. And I had tried a fire extinguisher and water and all kinds of stuff. I couldn't put the fire out. It was a disaster. I mean, just awful. One of our neighbors came and gave Kaylin a, a coat to put on. As we were standing out there, it was 22 degrees or something. So the next day, the fire inspector was there and my insurance agent was there. And he said, hey, I looked on the internet. I see you're a professional musician. I said, yeah. He said, well, if you look at this teeny weeny fine print on your insurance contract, it says professional musician liability limit one thousand dollars what about forty five fifty sixty thousand dollars worth of stuff in there he gave me a check for a thousand bucks how's that for the blues so we had to rent a one-bedroom apartment and hunter ha had to go live with his mom for a while because she had a place where the dogs could be so abby and tater and hunter went out to Lawrenceville where Debbie was living and we were in this little one-room apartment while we were waiting for the house to be rebuilt. Man, it seemed like forever. So after the fire burnt the house down, the Atlanta Blues community rallied together to help me out. And we put on a fundraiser at Jake's Toad House it was a benefit. I had the Forest on Fire album, so we used a lot of the posters for that for the benefit. And the headliners 
were Bob Margolin, E.G. Kite, Mike Martin, Barry Richmond. We had just a fabulous cast and the music all day long was unbelievable. We taped it and it was supposed to be an album. And a guy named Mark Astra had the tapes, but he disappeared with them and I never got the recording. That was too bad. May 10th was approaching rapidly. That was our two year anniversary of dating. And we had agreed if we made it through everything in the two years and we were still cool, then we could probably stick together. So we flew to Las Vegas, we got married, we took, we had, we took a limo from the chapel to the airport and we got on a helicopter, flew over the Grand Canyon and landed at the Diamond Bar Ranch. It was the oldest ranch. It was the first silver mine in Nevada. So we got on some horses and we were riding through the desert. We saw a jackrabbit with gigantic ears. We rode right up to the edge of the Grand Canyon. It was so cool and beautiful. Then we rode the horses back to this cowboy town. It was like a little ghost town, but they had a chuck wagon and a, a singing cowboy like Roy Rogers. And while the meal was being prepared, we walked through the town and everything. It was a lot of fun. We went back and we were staying at the Paris right across from the Bellagio and we saw the, you know, the fountains go up and we went to uh, Cirque du Soleil and we had a fabulous time. We had a night where my friend Phil came to hang out with us. Phil is a doctor. He's an unbelievable pool player. One time he sank 568 balls in succession. That was incredible. And he was also a great martial artist. He um, taught some champions the Gracie Jiu-Jitsu style. So he picked this up in his trike, this three-wheeled motorcycle that had a V8 engine on it. He'd hit the throttle and the G-force would put us back uh, in, uh, against the seat. It was like a rocket ship taking off. It was unbelievable. We'd stop at lights and people would grab their cameras and be flashing on us. Well, after a couple of days in Vegas, we drove down to Palm Springs to see my old guitar buddy, Bobby Zinner. Now, Bobby and I were in the force together in the 70s, and we had made great music together throughout the years. So Bobby put us up at the best hotel in Palm Springs for a wedding present. That was during the time when that series 24 was really big. You remember that series, right? Well, we saw Kiefer Sutherland and a, a bunch of the actors were at the hotel we were staying at. Bobby had a regular gig at Cal David's Club, the Blue Guitar. And I planned it so that we would show up on the night that he was playing. And I sat in and played with him the whole night. It was really a great time. Well, we flew back to Atlanta at the end of our honeymoon and my friend Johnny Barnes who lives on the other side of New Bedford in Marion and he invited us for a couple of days of sailing he had a big sailboat so I thought that sounded great because I wasn't doing anything and my old drummer Charlie Flannery met us there at the dock now our plan was to spend the night at the dock and then go out sailing for a couple of days after that Charlie showed up and he had, and Charlie was my old drummer. At one point he wanted to start a band with me called McFlan, McDonald and Flannery. But he brought some, I don't know, a ton of booze and some Quanapin and was smoking some reefer. And we, we, Johnny and Kaylin and Charlie and I were laughing and we had a great time. We stayed up late telling stories. Then we finally hit the sack. We got up the next morning. And Charlie, the old salt, man, he was green. He was like combination hungover, seasick from just sitting at the dock all night. And he said, I gotta go. I can't go sailing, I'm done. So we bid Charlie adieu and we cast off. And we were sailing around Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket and everything. 
and my friend Bill Narkowitz, who does the WMVY Blues Show, was on the air. So I called him up and I said, hey Bill, we're anchored just two miles off the coast here. And he said, oh, this is great. He said, I'm on the air. And he played a bunch of our material and talked over the air to us and like that. And we spent the night somewhere anchored. And the next day we were headed back to Fairhaven. That's where Johnny had the boat. And he said, you want to take the wheel? So I said, sure. So we were sailing in and all of a sudden a massive gust of air came up. And the whole boat was like this. And we were leaning back and I said, oh shit, I gotta turn back into the wind. And I threw the wheel and finally the boat righted itself and we were okay. But that was a harrowing moment. I hadn't sailed since I was 16 on Narragansett Bay and we had our old snipe sailboat, 16 footer, quite a bit different from a 30 plus foot boat. Well, we drove back to Atlanta after hanging out with Johnny for a while. I spent a lot of time in 2005 playing with Crystal and the Cruisers. We had some really big dates that Kalen sang back up on. And here's a few pictures you can see. So my friend Charlie Flannery came to Atlanta to visit and we were playing at a hotel. Well, Charlie had a suit on and like this and it was the class of 63 high school reunion. Well, Charlie wrote on a, on a napkin, Charlie Flannery, class of 66, and he stuck it in his pocket. So he was in there and walking around, we were playing, and he was at the buffet and the, the bar and like this, and everything was, you know, kind of cool. Well, at one point, the guy who arranged to have the band there came right up to the front of the stage and he's you know, grooving on us and enjoying the music and Charlie had my black motorcycle cap that he found as one of my props and he he walked up to the guy behind him and I could see this clear as day and Charlie you know started kind of hunching him from behind and everybody in the crowd was like aghast with horror. I was on the stage just like I could barely contain myself with laughter. Well then about a half a dozen guys, Charlie was done and he turned around and walked off and the guy who was being kind of ridiculed, he turned around and nobody was there. He didn't know what was going on. But the next thing is I see about six guys they had lifted Charlie up by the arms and had escorted him out of the ballroom. It was pretty funny. Well, Charlie went to the bar and there was Peter Noon from Herman's Hermits there. They were playing the Gwinnett Coliseum. So Charlie had a couple of drinks with him and then the show was over and uh, it was we laughed about it all the way home. It was really funny. So I got an offer to play with a hotel band in North Miami Beach for as long as I wanted. Well, okay, so I flew down there and I'd come home every, you know, two weeks or something and Kalen would pick me up at the airport, she'd have a couple of doobies and would smoke them and would party for a couple days and then I'd have to go back to the hotel gig. Well, one night we heard about a hurricane coming in. It was called Katrina. And I thought, all right, in 1962, I was in Hurricane Donna in Barrington, Rhode Island, and it hit, and water came up in our house and all kinds of stuff, so I said, hey, I can handle a hurricane. Well, it hit, and the, I was on the top floor, and rain started pouring in underneath the door that walked out to the balcony and everything. Well, I went out there just to take a look, and I heard this noise. It sounded like, <laughs> like a freight train was coming. I think it was a tornado that was spawning. I tried to get in the room, and the, the, the pressure had lowered so much, I could barely get the door shut, but I finally got it shut. And Katrina hit. It was only a Category 1, but I was right smack dab on the beach. 
the top door, the emergency escape door, blew right off the hinges. So rain was pouring in there and oh, it was a mess. So it, the gig was canceled and I barely got to the Fort Lauderdale airport driving around trees in the road and whatnot and got a connection home. Well, finally, it was around December and I, I had had enough of being away from home and had saved a couple of bucks. And we went through Christmas and 2006 came around. Well, I had gotten a call from somebody up in Richmond, Virginia that wanted me to come up and do some playing. Well, my son from my first marriage, Forrest Bryan was there and he was desperately in need of some fatherly guidance. And Hunter was sick of Georgia, it was too hot for him. So we're out on the porch and I had my guitar and I hit a C chord. And I said, Kaylin, are you ready to go somewhere and start a new adventure? And she said, yes. I said it again, are you ready? And she said, yes, I'm ready, ready. As a woman can be. And bingo, I launched into this song. And I wrote it in five minutes and maybe over the next half hour we finalized it. And it was our first song that we wrote together. It was really cool. I would have had to have been crazy to leave Atlanta because so many great things had happened in the 13 years. But a parent's duty is to their children. And if the children need help, by golly, don't matter how great things are going, you gotta pack it up and go help them out. So that's exactly what I did. And I left Atlanta and all of my friends behind and moved up to Richmond, Virginia. It was a new chapter, we were turning the page. So 2006, I came up to Virginia, was looking around and I found this beautiful place right on a creek out in the woods where I am now. You know, it's got deer in the yard and beaver and possums and, and all kinds of birds. And it, I mean, it's a, it's a wild nature habitat practically. So it was really great. Now, when we got to Richmond, I looked up the River City Blues Society and they were putting on a show at Arthur's in Richmond. And Bob Margolin and Nappy were going to play the show. So, Kalen and I went, I called Bob and told him we were coming, and he, you know, was expecting us, and we met Nappy, the night time is the right time, and he was great, and he and Kalen got along really well, and it was a fun event, and it was a welcome to Richmond kind of thing, so that was our exposure to the blues society and the blues scene in Richmond. We had a fun time. Kaylin and I started writing some songs together and I love swing music and one day I heard this Bob Wills and the Texas Playboys do a song called Riding On Down. It was really cool, it started off and I changed it a little bit. I said, hey Miss Kaylin, have you seen Joe? And she sings back, yes, I saw about an hour ago he was looking sad Riding along and singing this song Goodbye gal, goodbye baby You're gonna miss me someday baby But I'm riding on down Yes, I'm riding on down Well, I don't know where I'm going But I know I'm somewhere bound Ain't it a shame That's why I'm leaving So goodbye gal accumulating enough songs to record a CD. 
and we did. We said, okay, we need some pictures, we need artwork, all of those old contacts I had were in Atlanta. So my friend John Carr's daughter, Vicki, came out, she had a really good camera in Photoshop, and she took pictures for the album for us, and I had gone to Memphis and taken a picture of one of the stars, maybe it was Hollywood, the Walk of Fame, and Vicky photoshopped it to say nothing wrong with dreaming and put it on a musical note and we put it on the cover. One night I was in bed and I, I felt this groove in my head. I ran down the hall to the studio and first I played the bass on the keyboard and recorded it. Then I added all the parts and came up with the words and it was called Nothing Wrong With Dreaming. And Kaylin would, had told me, she said, oh, my mom sang on the Grand Old Opry once and boy, if I could just make a record once, it would just be a dream come true. And I thought, why not? All my other relationships had kind of fallen apart because my spouses weren't musicians. And when I'd go to play music, they'd say, oh, you're going to ignore me again now, huh? Well, I, I thought, okay, the way to keep it together is bring the music into the family. Well, Kalen was a country singer, as I mentioned in a previous video. And you know, I was a blues artist, so we had a long way to go to kind of meet in the middle. But the result of that was nothing wrong with dreaming. I'll play some songs for you here. I hope you like it. And... Uh, it took probably maybe two years to get that one out. Mailed it out to the stations. We got some really nice reviews. And we were off and running as a family band. And that, my friends, brings us up to the end of 2007. I hope you enjoyed today's story. It's been great riding along with you. As you can see by the fall colors, we're almost into winter, but I wanted to get at least one more story outside because the comments I got from you all were really good about the background. Now, if I can ask you, I see a lot of people watch the video, and maybe it's just because you don't have a YouTube account, but I'm not getting a lot of thumbs up. We have grown in subscribers. We're still trying to get to that thousand subscriber mark. So please, like the video. Share it with a friend and ring the bell so you can get notification of the next story. You'll be right on the front line. Now, in the meantime, you know how this goes. Keep love in your heart. Keep a song in your head and never let it go. And I will see you down the musical story highway on the next adventure of the old time rock and roller. So long, my friends. Let's take it out with some music. It's a wonderful night And the moon is shining bright I'm in a space trouble free I'm as happy as can be We're walking down the street Just you and me It wasn't long ago That my days were dark as night
Ronaldo.